Hi guys, as you can probably hear outside, it is a stormy day here in the end times in the uh, floodplain paradise here during our first flash flood warning of 2018 here on this gloomy stormy Wednesday morning, I believe, March 28th. It was March 28th or 29th, somewhere in there, uh, 2018. So uh, I think we've had four inches of rain in the past 12 to 15 hours with up to three more inches heading towards my little house on a floodplain. So I cannot think of a better day to bring you my climate change meltdown roundup plan, where I simply open up the pages of the mainstream media to see how this uh, planet is going <clears throat> directly into a burning lake of fire while my little uh, house on the floodplain gets ready to go floating down the river. And as I was mentioning yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, that one of the, the new words to uh, epitomize 2018 is the word dire. I have noticed pretty much every time I turn on the mainstream media nowadays, <coughs> the word dire showing up. So right after I finished that rant yesterday talking about the dire situation, probably an hour after that, I opened up <coughs> the mainstream media to this headline. <clears throat> NASA is watching Arctic sea ice closely and it has a dire warning for us all. Oops, I need to go get my buttons. I will be right back. I don't know where my fucking buttons are. You'll just have to, uh, as I go through this rant, since my bullshit detect, ah shit, they're out there in the barn. Since my bullshit detector button and my no shit Sherlock button are stuck out in the barn, uh, you'll need to decide as we go through it. Anyway, which button? NASA is watching Arctic sea ice closely and it has a dire warning for us all. Uh, so this is looking, I, I can't believe there still are NASA satellites. Uh, so this is, uh, NASA uses <coughs> its uh, satellite camera power <coughs> to provide data on sea, level, uh, sea ice levels via the National Snow and Ice Data Center, which records the seasonal changes in the amount of sea ice and plots trends over time. Now, in its most recent data dump, the group is once again sounding the global warming alarm and things are not looking good. According to the most recent readings, the annual sea ice maximum, the maximum, that is the point at which the most Arctic, the most Arctic sea ice is present on a per year basis, has been at its lowest points over the fast four years. That means that out of all the recorded data, going back, I don't know, I think to 1979, uh, that means that out of all the recorded historical on-the-ground data, 2015, 2016, 2017, and now 2018 were lower than every other year. And the numbers are not even close. So, uh, as several stories 
mentioned, and I mentioned uh, last week when this data was starting to come in, that actually uh, 2017, uh, 20, 2018 was actually just a hair thin coming in second place before last year in 2017, but it was pretty much statistically insignificant. What the, the important thing here is that it's the last four years uh, when, when you look at 2015, 16, 17, and 18 combined that you will understand how dire, dire the situation is. So this year, the Arctic sea ice is 448,000 square miles, otherwise known as 1,160,000 square kilometers below normal. But there is some lemonade to be made from this. <clears throat> As Arctic Ocean ice nears record low for winter, a boost for shipping. There you go. Winter sea ice on the Arctic Ocean covered the second smallest area on record this year, part of a thaw that is opening the region to more shipping and oil exploration and maybe disrupting weather far to the south, scientists said on Friday. Do you think so? So the uh, global shippers and the oil drillers um, cheering on the uh, melting of the ice caps. All right, from polar ice caps to inland ice, otherwise known as glaciers. <coughs> World glacier melting passes point of no return, finds steady. The further melting of glaciers worldwide cannot be prevented in the current century, even if all the emissions are curtailed, a study has found. I've, I've mentioned this story before in my doomsday headlines. It always bears repeating, human activity will have a massive impact well beyond the 21st century, according to the study published in the journal Nature Climate Change. Uh, there you go. Uh, So, talking about how the Paris Climate Change, the Paris Climate Accord being an absolute joke about stopping uh, sea level rise, which leads me into this article from New York Magazine. <clears throat> the Paris Climate Accords, I don't know, they make this plural, the Paris Climate Accords are looking more and more like fantasy. They were looking like fantasy the day they were signed, but uh, looking back uh, a couple of years, remember Paris? It was not even two years ago that the celebrated climate accords were, were signed, defining two degrees of global warming as a must-meet target and rallying all the world's nations to meet it. And the returns, I mean, two years later, are already dispiritingly grim. As I've already mentioned last week, this week the International Energy Agency announced that carbon emissions grew 1.7% uh last year and we are climbing again and despite the uh, hilarious story i'm getting ready to read even before the new spike not one single major industrial nation was on track to fulfill its commitments made 
in the Paris Treaty. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna get back to China in a minute, but this winter has brought even worse news. Brought even worse news than the abject failure of Paris compliance in the form of a raft of distressing papers about what beyond compliance is required to stay below this unadulterated horseshit two degrees. Once again, even if each of those 195 countries were to suddenly shape up dramatically cutting back on fossil fuels to bring emissions in line with their targets, that would still be not nearly enough to hit even Paris's quite scary target. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, I think we've heard this before. Uh, according to these recent papers, uh, any chance of this happening are something close to fantasy, at best uneconomical and entirely untested at scale and at worst wholly inadequate to the job being asked of them. Talking about this unadulterated horseshit, uh, geoengineering, carbon capture, and storage, all of this shit. Um, anyway, uh, you know, guys, uh, we're 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 fucked. Uh, I'm gonna put the uh, link on to this story. I could have just made this story my entire rant. Uh, this New York Magazine. Uh, one more uh, paragraph. How not good? Another new paper sketches in horrifying detail what this would mean though its findings are smuggled under cover of rhetorical optimism. Yes, rhetorical optimism. Okay, now we're going to go visit two countries. This pretend like ham bone little tail is holding his no shit Sherlock button in one hand and his bullshit detected button in the other. Which button? would you be pushing? First, let's go up there to Canada. Canada to miss its 2020 climate target. Canada will likely miss its 2020 interim carbon emissions reduction target and will need to take strong measures if it further hopes to meet its Paris agreement commitment, but now we're going to go over to China. China. <laughs> take, take, take a wild guess uh, what, uh, what button to push on this one from Reuters News. Apparently just reporting this as straight news with uh, no hint of irony. China meets its 2020 carbon target ahead of schedule, according to the Chinese government. China met its 2020 carbon intensity target three years ahead of schedule last year, the official 
Chinese Xinhua News Agency reported yesterday, citing the country's top climate official. Hmm. China, the world's biggest energy consumer, cut its 2005 carbon intensity level or the amount of climate warming carbon dioxide it produces per unit of economic growth. Carbon intensity fell over 5% in 2017 compared to the previous year, the environment minister said, suggesting that China's war on pollution also helped reduce greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> God. Uh, anyway, there you go. You heard it right here on Reuters News. Nowhere does, does Reuters News interview one single person on this planet with a fucking brain. Just reporting this as straight news and I'm not going to name any names, but for all I know, some of my fellow members in the Doomosphere who uh, just sit down and read the daily headlines like I do, I uh, just, just read this uh, story on out and, and went on to the next story. D which is what I'm going to do now, because I've heard enough of this fucking bullshit to last me a lifetime. Okay, getting back. Uh, from the bullshit detector button to the real button. New data confirm increased frequency of extreme weather events. Who do you think so? Uh, new data show that extreme weather events have become more frequent over the past 36 years with a significant upticks in floods and other hydrological events it compared even with just five years ago, according to this new research, uh, extreme weather events in Europe preparing for climate change adaptation uh, by the European Academy's Science Advisory Council. There you go. Uh, given the increase in the frequency of extreme weather events, the council calls for stronger attention to climate change adaptation across the European Union. <clears throat> there you go. So this is mainly uh, focused on Europe, but on the on the larger global scale. Globally, according to the new data, the number of floods uh, and other what they call hydrological events has quadrupled since 1980 and doubled since, since 2004, highlighting the urgency of adaptation to climate change. Uh, climatological events such as extreme temperatures, droughts, and forest fires have all more than doubled since 1980, as have meteorological events such as storms. There you go, such as the one that just passed over Garfield, Texas. <clears throat> Let's go back up to the permafrost. Uh, climate policy carbon emissions from permafrost. Uh, Wow. 
climate policy that results in little or no effort to control greenhouse gases would likely result in a substantial release of carbon from the permafrost region. I've already, I've already gone over uh, I've already gone over this no shit Sherlock story about the methane bomb being much worse than we thought. Uh, many versions of this story all over uh, the, the mainstream media this week. This one from Mashable. In court, oil company admits the reality of human-caused global warming but denies guilt. Um, this was this, uh, th this court case going on out there in San Francisco, uh, wh which I've talked about. Uh, the case involves several fossil fuel companies in two major cities, San Francisco and Oakland. The cities are suing the world's oil giants, Chevron and Shell and others, for extracting and selling fuels that the companies knew would stoke climate change and sea level, sea level rise. Adapting to these changes requires massive infrastructure undertakings such as building formidable concrete seawalls and the coastal cities want big oil to pay. And uh, so anyway, what we have is now so big oil admitting that uh, that climate change is by it, it is no one is denying well I don't say no one at least people in big oil can no longer deny this uh, but of course it's not the fault of the oil companies. Uh, it is the people who buy the products from the oil companies. It's their fault, meaning it's our fault. And, and guys, uh, you, you know, all kidding aside, how long have I had this rant? Uh, this goes back to 1957 in Atlas Shrugged when Ayn Rand points, there was pointing out there is one way to put these planet-eating motherfuckers out of business. It is to stop buying their products. If we had refused in 1957 to buy the oil company's products, we would not be in this fix we're in today. Uh, any oil company executive claiming uh, blame your, look in the fucking mirror, mirror and blame yourself for uh, taking down this planet, you clueless fucking moron hypocrite. I agree with them. Anyway, moving on, uh, let's see, what do we got next? Let's go over to India. Several stories coming out of India. Unfortunately, my computer does not want to hand over the story. Story, brace yourself, India. Summer 2018 is going to be too hot to handle. Already, the uh, the heat waves slamming into uh, to India. So here's another one. Low on water already. India unprepared for summer heat. Uh, while weather forecast predict a scorching summer this year. Water levels in major Indian reservoirs 
are already at an alarming low. India is staring at a water crisis this summer with the heat settling in earlier than usual in many parts of the country, water storage at major reservoirs have plummeted to critical lows at a time when the Weather Bureau has predicted higher than usual temperatures across India from March to June. Uh, before the monsoon rains offer any relief. Uh, water storage in 91 major reservoirs across the country averaged a mere 32 percent uh, over their total storage capacity. This is 12 percent lower than the storage in the same period last year. And meanwhile, uh, the India Meteorological Department has predicted that summer could be particularly severe in 2018. Do you think so? Okay. Next. <coughs> from India to Alberta. Alberta's boreal forest could be dramatically altered this century due to climate change. As models by University of Alberta biologists predict big changes due to climate change and wildfires. Not to mention uh, just uh, bulldozing the overburden for ramping up the Alberta, Alberta tar sands. Okay, let's go from, look at turtles. We've been talking about uh, this, what, three feet of seawater could mean for the world's turtles, and they're not even talking about sea turtles in, in this look, which are completely fucked. I mean, you could completely kiss goodbye uh, sea turtles. Where the fuck do you think sea turtles are going to be laying their eggs uh, with three feet of sea? And so we're not even talking about the fucked sea turtles. We're looking at freshwater turtles a sea level rise set to impact about 90% of coastal freshwater turtles. Uh, but I expect the freshwater turtles in Garfield, Texas are having a blast today. Let's see what is going on at the New York Auto Show today, SUVs to steal the New York International Auto Show. Hmm. Yes, there will be a few cars, but SUVs will capture most of the headlines at this year's New York International Auto Show. Automakers will be shoring up gaps in their SUV lineups and revamping models that already are popular in the hottest selling part of the U.S. market. Uh, SUVs, which hit a record 43%, 43% of U.S. auto sales last year at just over 7.3 million will steal the show in 2018. But uh, don't worry, you can just go out 
and buy all the SUVs you want because we have a new plan. We have a new plan to quote stop global warming by sprinkling table salt into the sky. It sounds like a wacky idea out of science fiction, but a climate scientist has suggested that planes could sprinkle salt into the sky to slow down global warming. This idea was being batted, batted about at a conference this week by a clueless fucking moron, mad scientist Robert Nelson, you know, based on the old idea that salt, plain old table salt, would reflect more of the sun's rays back into space. Yes, some scientists have suggested that such technology could be used as a stopgap to reduce temperatures while measures to limit CO2, CO2 emissions are put in place, but others have suggested that when solar radiation management is withdrawn, it could lead to rapid global warming in a phenomenon known as termination shock. Not to be deterred, Nelson says that sodium chloride or table salt is safe, readily available, and would not have negative effects on the weather, but he does admit, quote, even if successful, this would be a palliative, not a final solution. But we're going to uh, wind up with uh, this story I mentioned uh, yesterday. The, from the Apocaloptimist, if sprinkling table salt isn't going to save us from clim climate change, there's nothing to worry about because, uh, because anyway, I guess the, my computer has eaten the story because as this story says, it, it's easy to prove that uh, humans have, have already adapted to abrupt climate change 11,000 years ago, and we went right on going about being humans. It didn't make a fucking bit of difference. So if we did it before, we're going to find out ways to do it again. Uh, you know, sprinkle some damn salt in the sky uh, you know, do as Guy McPherson is cheering on. Uh, you know, building sea walls around the polar ice caps to prevent uh, warm ocean water from undermining glaciers and just put tens of thousands of blimps out there uh, hanging uh, six mile by six mile sheets of mylar to reflect uh, to, to reflect the sunlight, uh, and we can, uh, and, and there's no reason uh, why we, we can't do this, guys. Uh, Guy McPherson's all over it. Uh, of course, what it fails to mention in the story is the abrupt climate change they were talking about 11,000 years ago is when it got a little bit colder and, and humans just got the hell, uh, put on a few more clothes and, and, and got the hell a little closer to the equator for a few years before they moved back in and uh, just, just a small inconvenient truth that uh, that was the abrupt climate change they were talking about. Was it getting a couple of degrees colder for a few years and not the planet going Venus for eternity. 
But anyway, uh, I need to wrap up this week's climate change meltdown roundup rant and start filling some sandbags to keep my real estate investment from floating down the river, uh, which I think I might be able to hear roaring in the, uh, in the near distance. So I better get out of here before I wash away. We are so fucked. Bye, guys. Oops, hold on.